Well, you know, Sunday you kept going in and out. So yeah. connected. Oh, I didn't get my little holder. <laughs> That side is still blurry. Oh. Is that, where's the camera on this side? Okay. So maybe there's something smudged on it. Mm -hmm. It could be inside that. Uh, no, you don't have a screen protector. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Hey, Roberta. Nice to see you. Hey, Nikki. Nikki, is it as hot in Florida as it has been up here? Or is it just regular down there? I can see our my phone, for some reason, this side is very blurry. It's weird. My side. My side. Your side's clear as a bell. Not sure what's happened to my phone, but. Me too, neither. Oh, yeah. If only I had a phone guy. Well, you probably need a new phone. You gonna buy me one? Yeah. I okay. Am. I gotta buy me <clears throat> one too. Oh, Nikki said it's very hot. Well, you get yours first, and I'll wait. No, uh, next spring. Okay. It is really blurry. It looks like there's a film over it. Yeah, but this is what you need to look at. I'm looking at this right here. Okay. Hey, Marianne. It's so good to see you. Um, <clears throat> I got a friend request. You got a friend request, too, from Marianne's son, I guess it is. Yeah, I've accepted it. Good. We hope everybody's well, staying cool. Today is not a hot tea day. Today is an iced tea day. You would drink coffee on the equator. Hot coffee. That sounds good, actually. I bet they got man. good coffee down there. Oh, well, we are going to go ahead and get started. Would you open us in prayer? I will. Father, we thank you for bringing us together again. and Thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that we make good use of our time today, Lord, and that we would learn from it. And I ask a blessing on Angie and, and the Holy Spirit would anoint her to teach and let the Holy Spirit be on our ears to hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I always have this little, <laughs> when you say teach. Teach. Because, yeah, because I just don't feel like I'm teaching. <clears throat> I feel like I'm just sharing. Is she not teaching? I don't Do feel you like not I'm feel teaching. like she's teaching? Was it your, not your son, Billy? Do you have a son named Billy? It was Billy Gum. We hope you have a son named Billy because... Well, it, it could be a nephew. It could be a True. distant family member. I don't know. Anyway, um, <clears throat> last week I had, I got dehydrated. I had cut the grass on Monday evening, which I waited till really late in the day. It was after 7 o'clock. Um, oh, thanks, Mickey. Um and so it was late in the day. It was fairly cool. I have a problem with the heat because of previous situation. And um, <clears throat> so I'm really careful. And uh, I went to bed and woke up the next morning. And instantly upon waking, I knew something was wrong. My All of my calf muscles, my thigh muscle, my arms, everything was just in a bad cramp. And I got up. I got some water, I took my medicines, I took my magnesium, which is what I take when I start getting those cramps. Anyway, I generally try to wait until about 10 o'clock in the morning before I post Bible study because I always know, you know, anything can come up. Somebody can call and need help, whatever. And it didn't take me long to figure out I, I was not going to make it to 10 o'clock. So I had a long day uh and we just realized i must have been very badly dehydrated and 
So Paul was bringing me Gatorades and all of this stuff. And by the end of the day, I was feeling better. The next day, I still was a little bit slow, but on the mend. So um, that's why I ended up having to cancel Bible study last week. And I always hate to do that. And I try to wait to the last minute. But I know y'all understand. And I appreciate your patience with me. And um, so anyway... Today is a good day. I haven't been outside except to do a little, little few little tasks. But we are going to finish up today the section um, on teaching to love their children. So I guess I'm sort of teaching in that way. Wow. Oh, y'all are so sweet. Yeah, Marianne, maybe he's just trying to figure out who this crazy lady is that's in his mom's life. <laughs> blessing anyway um let's look at titus chapter 2 3 through 5 and by now y'all probably all know it by memory <clears throat> you want to read it i just posted the scripture um the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness not also teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober to love their husbands to love their children to be discreet chaste keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Amen. That, that's our text. That's our, our instructions. That's our job description um, as we serve Christ and as older ladies especially. But we're in that section in verse 4. Um, to teach young women to be sober, to love their husbands. And this section is to love their children. Now, I've said this every time, and I will continue to say it. If you have not birthed children out of your own body, please don't feel like you're not included, because I don't know any woman who does not have someone in their life that they are not an influence on. And, and in that sense, it's a mothering type thing, and so... Please don't assume if you haven't birthed children from your own body that you aren't a mother in any way, shape, or form, and and um, you, this doesn't pertain to you. It absolutely pertains to you if you have anyone in your life that you have an influence on. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, and I'm glad you say that because there are so many people that, uh, well, we'll just look at Focus on the Family, James Dobson's broadcast and ministry. He's He's not in it now. I think he's still living, but someone else is running that. But for many years, I listened to that when we had a young family. Years and years listened to him, and it was relevant. But it's still relevant because we all have a family and relationships, whether you have children at home, empty nest, or whatever. So you can still get something from that. Absolutely. And um, I appreciate you saying that. Absolutely. <clears throat> and so we're going to talk today. We talked last time about discipline, about chastening, about the difference between discipline and punishment, and, and um, you know, about um, guiding your children. And, and I'll tell you, a child that is left without discipline by his mother or his father is going to not be a happy, productive adult. And we see that all the time in our society. It's heartbreaking. Now, I want to say something in that vein, and I'm not sure that I said it. I went back over last time's video just to see if I could find it. And I, I think I may have missed it. But periodically, no matter how much discipline you do, no matter how much instruction you give, no matter how much um, correction and, and direction you offer a child, they are not going to listen. And every human being, in my opinion, in your opinion too, I assume, has a choice to obey or not to obey. You train, you train, you train. But every now and then a train derails for whatever reason. Um, and in those cases, let me just, as a sister in Christ, encourage you, it ain't over till it's over. It ain't over till it's over. 
So well, when, when they quit listening, then you can just quit telling. Right, but I mean, until they breathe their last breath, there's always <clears throat> a hope. Oh, yes. And um, sometimes as a parent, when you have a wayward child, you think, where did I fail? Where did I go wrong? And maybe you did go wrong. Maybe you did make some colossal mistakes. But ultimately, every child, every child grows up that does grow up has a choice, and it's between them and God. And I want to reassure you today as we talk through the scriptures, once that child leaves your home, leaves your responsibility, especially a daughter that you've handed over in marriage to a husband, you are no longer responsible. When a man reaches maturity, he moves out of his parents' home, he becomes responsible for himself, you are no longer responsible as the parent of that child. Now, as a brother or sister in Christ, we all bear responsibility for one another to encourage, to support, and if they come to us for guidance, to guide them toward the things of God. But as a mama and daddy, you are not held accountable by God once they are mature and moved out. Now, there are times as a parent that you need to go back and and have some discussions. If you've done something <clears throat> that has caused them pain, maybe you were not a great parent, maybe you were not present, maybe you made some, some um, really bad decisions when your child was young. And I said this once a long time ago to a lady who asked, she said, I, I'm serving God now, but my kids aren't. And I said, well, were you serving God when they were children? And she said, no. I said, well, then you have to let them get to that place of decision. I said, but you might need to go back and apologize for things that you did when you were raising them. And that that's important as an adult parent. But you don't have to apologize for all of their mistakes. Okay? That's between you and God what you need to apologize for. Amen. Okay. I always look to you for confirmation. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 3.1. Now that entire section of Ecclesiastes is so good, and y'all know this one, but we're yeah. just going to... Huh? Wasn't it the birds? They sang it? Yes, they did. Okay. Yes, they did. So if you're old enough to remember... The birds. The birds the singing... Band. Be wild, Hello, yes. sweet Tina. To everything there is a season. I want to break out the song here. And a time to every purpose under the heaven. Go ahead. Da, da, da. Yeah. <laughs> I could. We could have read this entire scripture, but we didn't really have time today because I have so much to cover. But remember this. As we're talking today about working our way out of a job. Um, and I'm going to clarify that fully, but there's a season and a time and a purpose for everything. And <clears throat> it is sad to watch somebody clinging to something that it's time for them to let go of. And as mothers... <clears throat> We have that moment in time where we have to make that decision to release our adult children into the world and allow them to walk their walk with God. <clears throat> I know, Mickey, mine did too. Turn, turn, turn. It's, it's nice, isn't it? When there's a good scripture. <laughs> that's, back good when, um, that's back when even rock songs had mentioned God, you know. Well, you know, there was that. Jesus freak movement back yeah, then. Yeah. I think was it Ringo Starr said. I don't know what he said. Well, he you know he was the Beatles in the Beatles, and he said we're more famous than God. Yeah. And there was an entire revolution of of people yeah. turning to God. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, so okay, we have done everything we can. We we can. We discipline. We train. We punish, we rebuke, we chastise, um, we teach our children. And the day comes when it's time for them to move on in life. And all of us are different. 
um, a woman who worked from the time she get her maternity leave ended and she worked a job outside the home. Children were sent to the public schools or whatever. They were put in every activity. That's one group of women. Then there are women who had to work. They didn't want to. And so every mm. moment was spent with their kids. Then there's the homemaking, you know, <coughs> home birth, homemaking, home schooling, home everything. And even though I didn't do home birth, I did all the rest of that. Um, I was 24 hours a day, seven days a week with rare sleepovers for my kids to go to see somebody. And a um, few times I let them go off to summer camp. Didn't work out well, so I had stopped doing that. So I was completely involved in my children's life and and I was very diligent to make sure they had lots of activities with lots of people but we're all different and then the day comes when they're graduating high school they're getting jobs meeting a, a potential spouse all of this is that process and then they leave home now our youngest child we graduated her a year early in homeschool because she had finished all of her courses and tested well. And then our last two children at home moved out. Oh, my goodness. When was that? Like maybe 12 years ago. Yeah. That long, mm, It's been a while. So we've been empty nesters for quite some time. Our last homeschool graduation, um, my family, unbeknownst to me, did an entire thing. They did a PowerPoint display of the children growing up and the graduations because that was her graduation, but it was also my official homeschool retirement. And it, it was hard. And once they moved out, the last two moved out into their own home, here I was, and Paul worked every day at his office. He was not home during the day. Here I was in a silent house. Very difficult. Very difficult for me. It took me a long time. Now, I didn't spend my day sobbing and, you know, become depressed and all. I just didn't know what to do with myself. Although I had plenty of hobbies and things here at home, I didn't know what to do with myself. I knew that I was not going to hover over my adult children because they were intelligent and there was no need for me to do that. But it was very difficult for me to figure out what to do next. And uh, those of you that are empty nesters, do y'all y'all relate to that? And it's really for men or men and women that have occupation, when you retire and you leave a company, in my case, I've been at my company 35 years. Even the first job I left, I'd been there 10 years before I came to the one I'm at for 35 years. So that's 45 years at full-time jobs that I've been doing of getting up and doing something every day, five, at least five days a week, a lot of times more than that. And you know, you, that's going to stop next year, but I'm ready. I don't think you was ready. I I was as mentally ready as I could be. Emotionally and physically, I wasn't ready because it's like, you know, okay, the train is pulled into the station, and now where am I supposed to go? That adjustment time, you have to allow for. You have to allow yourself to make that adjustment even if you're working outside the home there's a shift because now there's no more school there's no more daycare there's no none of that it all stops and something changes in more ways than one and tina said yes but they come back <laughs> uh, marianne said yes the early empty nest days were so hard i kept thinking who am i now and what do i do exactly uh, mickey said i went through that too it was like um okay now what i've been a mama since i was 18 years old i knew nothing else exactly and and how profound 
that shift is. It is it is like a massive earthquake in our life in every way. Let's look at um, Genesis two twenty four. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. When a child reaches maturity, there is a shift for us, but there's a shift for them. And whether or not it's it's entering into their own marriage and beginning their own family, or just them moving out and becoming autonomous, or whatever it is, <clears throat> there's a there's a a breaking away. And as mothers, especially, and I'm sure for fathers, we that. I don't know any other word to say, but that ripping away of that seam is painful. It depends on how long the, the, the pain of that is dependent on how well you've trained your children and the connection you have. I was never one that encouraged my children that, you know, when you grow up, you can go on adventures all over the world and you just you just go do whatever you want to because I don't see that in scripture. My job was to train children to be, have a home, be at home, build a family and all of that. So I never trained my kids to be world travelers. Um, that leave and cleave is important when a new family is being born. But the, the facts are, and I talked about this some last week, that tying strings one to another. When you've tied strings with your children, you've created these bonds. Even though it feels like it's being ripped or stretched, you've got these bonds that will not be broken. Um, when you've poured in your love, even a wayward child is going to have the memories of their childhood, it, and and they can't escape that. They'll never escape it in the sense that they want to escape it. But mama goes from active mothering to being a bystander. And depending on your personality, that is the hardest thing. You are now the keeper of the memories. You're no longer building so to speak you're just keeping the memories now um and i'm going to elaborate on that so don't get stuck on what i just said <laughs> second corinthians five seventeen. therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new this concept <laughs> we know when we are born again the old stuff is gone we're marching forward with new orders in christ living the life of Christ. As a mother, as a parent, you're doing the same thing. You are shifting from this mode where you lived to this mode. And, and a determination is going to be made, whether it's by active decision or by inactive decision. You're going to shift and make some choices for your future life. Uh, the world, I, I love this quote. The world I had known for the last three decades was now nothing but memories. The world that we knew is now just memories. The toys, the even the bedrooms of our children are no longer, you know, we had... We have four bedrooms in our home. One of the bedrooms is now a playroom guest room. One of the bedrooms is now Paul's office and library. And one of the, the bedrooms is now my sewing room. So, I mean, some people I know keep their children's things in place in their bedrooms. And maybe if you have a, lot, a large home and a lot of bedrooms in your house, you can afford to do that. We couldn't. So even the things in your home shift and change. And um, you're now the keeper of the memories. And that can be very difficult. I think that's why a lot of older women start scrapbooking. Hmm. 
because they need to make a place for those memories. They need to assign it <clears> to <throat> something. And I love scrapbooking. Um, and if you're not a mom now, who are you? If you're not the mom who's taking the kids to dance or football or music or whatever, if you're not the mom doing the carpooling every morning to school and 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 all of that stuff, you don't have to figure out how to keep the kids from being bored in the afternoon or what you're going to have for snack. Even adult kids that still live at home want a snack. So you got to shop for snacks, right? But there comes a day when you're not doing that anymore. Now, I know some of us, some of you have children that do come back home and live for a season, and it, it should only be for a season. But your entire system has shifted. We move from active mommy manager, schedule planner, education supervisor, teacher, coach, nurse, activity director, researcher, behavior specialist, and event planner to now being memory keeper, consultant, babysitter, encourager, emergency service personnel. There's, there's, <laughs> uh, our input changes. It's no longer as active. But what do we gain? We've lost this section, but we've gained something else. We've gained us. We've gained what we want. Now, I don't know about y'all, but for me, that, that is not easy. I have hobbies, but, but there was no direction for that. There was no, um, oh, well, now I can go do this. Now we can travel. Yeah, we're traveling, but you can't travel nonstop. You have to come back home at some point, right? So it's a process to begin shifting into that new thing. Um, Philippians 3, 13 through 14. <clears throat> Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark. I, I'm... And it says forgetting the things which are behind. You're not forgetting anything. It's just becoming a different life. Now we need to press toward the mark. We need to focus. As, as born-again Christians, we need to really put our future toward that prize. We need to invest ourselves into the lives of other people to minister, to support, to educate young women. Um, part of my... Part of my emptiness process is sharing the Bible studies because it's like a river. And I think about Chinnabee, you know, Chinnabee, it's a river up on Chow Mountain and it, or a lake. And it always looks so yucky when we go up there. It's a beautiful area, but it's like the lake is almost stagnant, but it has an outlet, outlet, inlet, outlet. It has a stream that runs out, but for some reason that water never looks alive. But it needs to have a flow in and it needs to have a flow out. Do you know what I mean? Now, when we went on our trip west, we stopped up in Missouri and we, we accidentally found a place called Mammoth Springs. We did not know it was there. We thought it was a rest stop on the highway and we pulled over to, you know, use the restroom and take a break from, from driving for a while. And this gorgeous, bubbling waterfall streams. I mean, it was just alive with water and life. And and uh, how many gallons of water pumped out of that spring? Nine million an hour. An hour. Nine million gallons of water an hour. I mean, this thing was effervescent. It looked like it was raining. You know how the water hits the top of, of the pond when it's raining? It looked like that, but it wasn't raining. It was actually bubbling and popping up from the bottom. It was incredible. But our life as daughters of the king, as servants of the Most High, <clears throat> our life should look like that. 
we should not look like a stagnant pond because, oh, the kids are grown up and, you know, I just don't know what to do with myself. No, 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 no. We should be able to convert all that energy that we invested into those children now into the things of God. We should be bubbling and, 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 and just bursting with effort for the king. And, and this scripture, I press toward the mark of the prize. And I think of running, running a race and, and you want that medal. And running, 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 running. Just keep pushing, keep going forward. Because when you don't, when you say, there's nothing left for me to do. My kids don't need me anymore. I'm not making any progress. I'm just going to stay in my nightgown and I'm going to have my Coke and I'm just going to be on the internet. And I'll be honest, some days I have those days. Sometimes I just want to be still and to be quiet. And how important it is on those days for us to stay in the word, stay in the scripture, reminding ourselves constantly of the things of God so that you don't get bogged down into that depressed state of, I don't have anything else to do. My life is over. My jobs are over. My task is over. I just, I'm not an influence on anybody. There are countless, countless people right probably within two miles of your house that are desperate for a, a grandmother figure, a Titus II woman, somebody to just give them a smile at the grocery store. It changes lives, even the least effort that we make. Our life is not over because children are not in our home. I, uh, I had this discussion with a man. That, uh, I went to one of the dams that I maintained yesterday, and he and I, while I was waiting on this computer to load up, he was mentioning that he was going to retire. And um, and I said, well, what are you going to do after retirement? And he said, it, he was working on something. He looked at me and said, not work. <laughs> and I, I kind of laughed about it because, I mean, we always have our goals. I want to travel. I want to spend more time with, the, you know, I want to do this. I want to, and we always have things. But his goal was to not work. And, well, I would love to know how that works out for him. Well, you know, not go to not go to work not every day office, and draw yeah. a check. That sounds yeah great, but when you're at home all the time, you've got to do something. Yeah, you can't just watch TV all the time and eat popcorn and what you know. You can't just do this. You can do that for a few days, but yeah. you can't just keep doing that. That's right. People that do that, they, they don't live very long. They don't stay That's in good right. health. You've got to be active and do something. Consequently, mothers, they need to move on and have a life and That's right. volunteer activities for people do what you're doing, having a ministry that you continue to teach the, the younger women, just like Titus too. Yes. Deuteronomy 30, 19. I call heaven and earth to record record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. I have, I, the first time I read my Bible through, I was nine. I made a commitment that time. <laughs> I'm going to read my whole Bible, and that was probably, it took me a while, but it was hard, but I made that commitment. But I remember this verse. I remember it from when I was a kid. I, I remember it all of my adult life, and it sticks out to me like a billboard. Choose this day. Blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. And I remember even as a child thinking to myself, isn't that sad that God would say, therefore, choose life. He's saying, okay, I'm putting this before you. You're going to make a choice. Choose this one. But many, many, many times in our weariness, in our frustration, 
in our sorrow, in our grief, we don't choose, but we are choosing. You know what I mean? It's like I said earlier, you either choose by active choice or you choose by inactive choice. We must choose life. Think about your children. If once you no longer have children at home, you're no longer the mommy, you're no longer doing the active mothering of, of when they're young. If you stagnate, if there is no activity, and your life begins to degrade. What is that telling your children? How are you helping them to be in a happy, mature, and blessed place? You're not. They just see a mom, and I'm not I'm not speaking to anybody in particular because I don't really know all of your home life situations. So if this is touching your heart, please let it be of the Lord and please let the Lord pull you up. Don't be depressed or or angry or bitter choose life choose to do something new just because that may have been all you knew before doesn't mean it's over for you choose something different i know a lot of ladies who became empty nesters and sadly lost their husbands very quickly and it was I know, I know quite a few ladies like that. And they stay in the house and they feel bad and they grieve their hearts out. And some of them don't live much longer because they're literally grieving themselves to death. But then I've seen some of these sweet little ladies go into the nursing home. Mm. You know, that's just, it's something that just draws all of us, doesn't it? Go visit the folks in the nursing home. And and you'll see these ladies going up there and, and they're not doing any big miraculous thing. They're just being there. They're sitting with somebody reading a magazine to them or they're doing somebody's fingernails or they're just, you know, bringing a birthday card. They're doing something because they they don't have an avenue to do something else. And I love it. I love it. I appreciate it so much because... They're choosing life. We must choose life. We must not allow circumstances to stagnate us. And I'm going to tell you, as and I've told my kids this, it's so much easier to be the mother of little kids than it is to be the mother of adult kids. Because little kids, you can spank their little behinds and put them to bed. You can snuggle them. You can talk to them sweetly and they receive it. You can offer them advice and they'll take it because mommy told me that. When they become adults, none of that is a given. It's very hard. As we stand at a door or a fork in the road, our perspective is a certain way. We see what is immediate and requires a certain response based on what we see before us. We use our experiences and our wisdom to whatever level to make decisions about how we will answer the question of what do I do now? As a Christian, we have the word of God to guide us and to be at peace with those choices. You as a born again believer have the word of God to help direct you. The biggest word is serve. Serve others. When you serve others in Christ, you choose life. Proverbs 19, 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. The world offers tons of time eaters things that will just take your time all day long you can just you know do this do that do this do that all day long so you've got some kind of activity remember when everybody used to say i gotta get home i gotta watch my shows i gotta watch my shows yeah because if you missed it back then it was gone forever that's right now it's all on youtube 
But you know, okay, I, well, I, I've got to go to the grocery store. I need to stop by the drugstore. Um, uh, and then I got to get home and watch my shows and then I'm going to start supper. And, and these schedules appear because of habit. But what are you investing yourself in? What are you doing for the kingdom? Your babies have grown up. You invested yourself in their lives then. Now what are you investing in? Uh, Proverbs 16, 9. Hey, sweet Aaron. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. That's so self-explanatory. If you come up with the plan... You know, Lord, maybe this is what you're telling me I need to be doing. And you step forward. God will guide you. And you know what? You may get just a little bit down that proverbial road. And and it's working into something you didn't expect. Allow the Lord to do that with you. Allow the Lord to guide you. Because he will. If you're submitting to him. Isaiah 30, 21. And by the way, in Proverbs 19, 21, where it says there are many devices in a man's heart, the word devices means thoughts. Ah. So we think a lot of things, but the counsel of the Lord is permanent. Amen. So I love what, that. That's what it's given us. I need to jot that on here. Uh, Isaiah 30, 21, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. I wanted to add that. We all know that scripture, but I hear so often, I just don't know what to do. Hmm. I don't know what to do. I don't even know where to start. Take a step. Take one step. Take the next step. Paul and I laughed the other night because we were talking about how, you know, when we were kids, the Tarzan movies and things, there was always quicksand. So we assumed that when we grew up, we were going to have to struggle through our life with quicksand. <laughs> the next time in my life I ran into that was in a Nintendo game called Quick Pitfall Harry. There was quicksand in Pitfall Harry. There was going to be quicksand. Surprisingly, I've never run up on quicksand in my life. But you know, as a kid, that's what's in your head, all these things that it you're going to have to It looked an awful lot face. like uh, sawdust floating on top of the it did. water, didn't it? It did. So if you think about quicksand, you're stepping off your porch and you're faced with a pool of quicksand. I don't even know how to refer to it. <laughs> What do you do? Do you stay on the porch or do you get to the other side? One step at a time. You put your foot down on solid ground. And then you pray. And you pay attention to the leading of the Lord. And then you take that next step. And you stay on solid ground. And then you try the next step. And that sounds so simple to say, but I promise you that's how it works. When you absolutely do not know what to do next, that's what you do. And the Lord will guide your steps and you will look and, and spiritually you will see, oh, well, I wanted to do this, but there, that is just not going to work. Well, I can do this and at least I'll be doing something and then God can guide me and you never know if that something was exactly where he wanted you to be to start with that has played true in my life many times Proverbs 3 5 and 6 trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding our understanding gets us messed up more than anything else following your your human mentality instead of looking at things spiritually and I, I I've been blessed to to be able to minister to a lot of women in my life but when I got to my deepest places it seemed like I didn't have somebody 
ministering to me. And I'd just sit by myself and I'd just pray and say, Father, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I remembered one time hearing in my spirit, speak to yourself the way you would speak to a woman in this situation. And of course, I had to think of David, King David, and how he had to do that. If you read the Psalms, you'll see him doing that over and over. Him speaking to himself to encourage himself, to build himself up, to, to support the things of God in his life when everything was falling around him. Sometimes you have to speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you to yourself. Mm. But you don't do it with that head of yours because that thinking, that human thinking is going to get you so twisted around. Think through the Spirit. And allow the word of God to minister to your heart and guide you where you need to go. Uh, Mickey said, I started investing in self. It was a really rough time for me once the kids weren't home. I started compulsively shopping because I was lonely and needed to distract myself by leaving the house. I invested in things and people or whatever would make me feel better. I made very bad decisions during that time that I regret every single day to this day. I thank the Lord that my eyes were open to this wrong road I was taking. Thank you for that testimony, Mickey. Thank you for that. So many of us struggle with things like that. It's And praise God for deliverance. Psalms 144, 9 through 15. <clears throat> I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings will I praise sing praises unto thee. It is he that giveth salvation unto kings, who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones, polished after the similitude of the palace, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may be bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Now, you might wonder why I wanted to add this scripture in, but I felt so strongly, and I should have added in the one, write the vision and make it plain that those that read it may run. You know the one I'm talking about? Habakkuk. Habakkuk. That scripture is another one that stays with me. If I don't define through the Lord, what he's telling me, what my heart is hearing or my spirit is hearing. If I don't write that down on the tables of my heart, if not on paper, when things get stressful, when you get worried, when you get overwhelmed with emotion, it's easy to forget the goal. And I love this scripture especially in 12 and 13, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. There's the garden scenario again. That our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. That's the goal. That's the goal. And I read this in Matthew Henry, and I wanted to share this with you. Hey, Kathy. First, It is pleasant to see our sons as plants grown up in their youth as olive plants. The planting of the Lord. To see them as plants, not as weeds, not as thorns. To see them as plants growing strong and great, not withered or blasted. To see them of a healthful constitution, a quick capacity, a twirdler, I don't even know how to say that. Towardly disposition. Towardly. Towardly disposition and especially of a pious inclination. 
likely to bring forth fruit unto God in their day, to see them in their youth, their growing time, increasing in everything that is good, growing wiser and better till they grow strong in spirit. That is the goal. That is what we spent our life doing as mamas of little ones. Discipline, growing with with the things of God and planting them for the Lord to see them grow up into fruitful trees when they move out from under our responsibility. And when I say responsibility, you know, you're always going to have a sense of responsibility for your children. Of course you are. But I'm talking about you being responsible to God for the choices they make as adults. You are not. Um, Aaron wrote, Amen. So many times I have spent trying to encourage or help someone else that I grew tired and frustrated when it didn't seem to be working. Andy and I had an opportunity to attend a parenting conference and my biggest takeaway was take care of me physically and spiritually. When we are best, rested and refreshed, obviously not selfishly or through vain pride, God himself will work. All we have to do is what he asks or tells and then let it go. Mm -hmm. Amen. That is excellent, Aaron. Excellent. So now we've read about our sons. Now let's read about our daughters. Secondly, it is no less desirable to see our daughters as cornerstones or corner pillars polished after the similitude of a palace or temple. By daughters, families, stay with me on this one. This is deep. By daughters, families are united and connected to their mutual strength as the parts of a building are by the cornerstone. And when they are graceful and beautiful, both in body and mind, they are then polished after the similitude of a nice and curious structure. That that just means different. When we see our daughters well-established and stayed with wisdom and discretion as cornerstones are fastened in the building, when we see them by, by faith united to Christ as the chief cornerstone, adorned with the graces of God's Spirit, which are the polishing of that which is naturally rough and become women professing godliness, when we see them purified and consecrated to God as living temples, we think ourselves happy in them. Isn't that a picture? I mean, a picture of godliness. I'm missing a page. Kathy has... Kathy has a call. I know, but I'm missing a page. Okay, you can look on with me. It's just these two passages. Okay, thank you. Um, I love the analogy of them growing strong like the plants. When I get discouraged, I remember something my great-grandmother had on her wall. When a plant is cut down to its root, it does not hate. It does not die. It used all of its might with the help of the Lord to grow back bigger, stronger, and more beautiful than before. That's good. That's good. Um, Marianne, that is Matthew Henry's commentary on our scripture. Um, Let my paper over. Uh, Psalms 144. Psalms 144. Um, you know, 9 through 15. If something. you don't use Blue Letter Bible, let me encourage you to get on Blue Letter Bible. I just found it. Um, on Blue Letter Bible, you can type in any word like a Strong's Concordance, any word, and it'll it'll give you all the definition and everything. And, uh, and then you also have the option to read commentaries and cross-references. And I love to read the Matthew Henry things um, because he just, I agree with him so much, and I learn so much from his writing. That's where um, Angie and I both get uh, the original Greek or Hebrew word from as the Blue Letter Bible, it has an interlinear uh, concordance that you go through, and you can look up um, any original word of that text. Uh, it shows it to you in It's very easy the Hebrew to operate, there. very That's user-friendly. Psalms 144 in Hebrew, and 
you go to the Strong's Word and tap that, and it gives you the whole. It's just a wonderful study reference, and then Matthew yeah. Henry commentary is there, um, and it's an app you can put on your phone. And I don't know if you use Bible Hub. I do. Bible Hub will you put a scripture in there, and it will list every translation, every version. Boom, 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 boom. And you can just go down and read every single one. And then it'll cross-reference to other scriptures similar. It's really good. Oh, Cheryl, we sure will be praying. Kathy said, I love that Blue Letter Bible. You shared that before, and it's helped so much. And I, it is so user-friendly. I love it. I love it. Okay, and, and before I close today, I wanted to add these, these in, and I encourage you to build on these. These are scriptures that you can use as prayer over your children, your adult children. Um, but remember, and I don't want to beat a dead horse here. <sighs> Lay off the burden that so easily besets you, mamas. I know that I'm not saying that in the scripture. I'm just saying it that way. We bear such a responsibility that is such a burden, a love burden, but a burden to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. When they become adults, you sit back and you watch the fruit. Some fruit is not necessarily good, but you can no longer change that planting. Whatever it is, it is. And that gardener must deal with their own fruit production. It's not you. And I guess really I'm just trying to relieve scripturally the, the burden that many feel that they've lost their chance. That, that now this has happened. The kids are not where they should be. And you just, you just failed and you've lost your chance. And, you're, you're bearing the weight and burden of that is not of God. You submit all of it into the Lord and you leave it in God's hands. You leave it at that altar. I just want to help you relieve that burden in your heart. And those of you who just want to help, the Lord understands that. Your help now is to be available, not to be a constant safety net where they know they can just make mistakes and mom and daddy's going to fix it. So we can blow all of our money and mom and daddy will just give us money or we can, we can, um, you know, just go have a party lifestyle and mom and daddy will take care of our kids. And, you know, that's a balancing act between being there when needed and being that net for them to jump off of whenever they don't feel like holding on anymore. That's a balancing act and we need wisdom. Can't wait to replay this all tonight. You have helped me put so much at the foot of the cross. God is in control, not me. Thank you both. We love you. Now these are two prayers, two scripture prayers. Ephesians 1, 17 through 19. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what his, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. This is a prayer, mamas. This is a prayer. And daddies, if you're watching, to pray over your children, to speak into your children's lives. Yes, you can't change a thing, but you can pray and you can consider it miracle growth fertilizer whenever you speak life into your children. 
when they're coming and they're just, you know, on the phone, you can't correct anything. You can't say, well, you know, if you do this, this wouldn't happen. And you should have done this. And I told you to do that. And, and you're just going to keep failing until you do what I say. That ain't going to do a bit of good. You must be spitting in the wind. It's useless. But I'm praying for you that God will give you wisdom. I'm praying that he will reveal himself to you. I'm praying that your understanding will be opened up to see the things of God in your life. I'm encouraging you. I'm praying for you. And that scripture is beautiful. Read it over and over and over until you get it way down in your spirit so that when you speak, it's automatically coming out. Honey, I know life is hard. I know that you're struggling and doing the best you can, but I want you to know that me and daddy are praying for you. I want you to know that not a day goes by that we don't cover you in prayer. Even if we don't talk to you, we're praying for you. Colossians 1, 9 through 12. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Woohoo! <laughs> I don't know if y'all are binder people. I haven't talked about this in a long time, but binders and notebooks are a good thing. My little desk over there. I, I thought you was going with that scripture about binding on earth what is bound. No. I don't know if you're binder I'm people, but three, bind it. Well, three ring binders. I have on my little desk right over there in front of me, there are six spiral bound notebooks. And I, and I don't put them away because I use them all the time. They're for different things. One's for Bible study with Paul. One's for morning uh, Sunday morning church, one's for this, one's for that. And I write things down and I keep them in order so I can refer to them later. And I'm going to give you two little suggestions. Number one, if you have a child, an adult child, even a small child, that you are, for whatever reason, unable to openly communicate with, write down your heart, not your the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked heart, your God heart, your spirit. Write down those words. Write down your prayers. Write down the things you wish you could say to encourage and support. Write those things down. Now, I'll be honest. I have arthritis, and it's very difficult for me to write more than a little bit with my hands. I can type, but I can't necessarily hold a pen for a long time. If you look in my, my notebooks, I do things outline style because it's short and I can keep track of it. But write down the things you want to say. And if you use that uh, speech to text, it doesn't understand Southern people. Yeah. It makes some words like really long that are only like three letters. So anyway, uh, he found this for me, Habakkuk 2, 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Next verse, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Oh, I hate it when I cry. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. I'm telling you, and you know what? Someday, if the Lord tarries, we're all going to die. You're going to stop breathing one day, and your life's going to be over. And you think, oh God, don't let me die until I see that restoration or that redemption day. But you know what? How powerful would that be? The day you leave this earth and go into heaven and they go through your stuff and that son or daughter finds that notebook that you spent years putting your prayers and your heart into for them. 
that may be their day. Don't give up, but don't bear the, the weight of what you could not do. Amen. We need a hug. We're hugging you too. Yoshana said, thank you, thank you, thank you for this today. Could not have hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Could not have hit the hell, nail on the head and on what's bothering me more solidly. Love and appreciate you both so much. Love you too. And you too, Marianne. We love y'all. We really, really do love you. And we pray for you. And, you know, we're all in it together. We're sisters in the Lord and brothers in the Lord. And, and um, God wants us to be successful, even when it doesn't look like we are. He wants us to be successful in this walk. Amen. I, I'm just... You got. You really was efficient today. I was trying to be. You went through I know all your I, notes, and you covered it. Extremely I'm telling you, well. three pages is all I can handle. When I have three pages, and this was four and a half. That was a lot. It was a lot of scripture. Yeah. I love point. the Bible, Paul. Seriously, I I'm love the Bible. You. It's got all our answers. I was thinking about how my dad shifted when I moved out of the home and went off to school and then later got married and all my life after that and how my dad shifted from that he gave me more freedom in my teen years but I remember a major decision that I made later in life that when I made it I didn't consult him first in some ways I felt guilty about it because I had always gone to him as a child or whatever but here I am making this decision and so I said well dad I had this decision I had the choice of this or this or this and chose this just to kind of see this kind of after the fact what he would say about it yeah and his response was well I know you wouldn't do anything without praying about it now that that could have gone two ways. I could have been praying about it, made the decision, and then that would have been good. Or had I not prayed about it, I, there could have been a red flag. And I thought, wait a minute, I didn't even pray about this. So his response was one that prompted me to do right the next time. Right. You know? That's good. So we do that as it could be um, a coworker. We're sitting around at work on a break, drinking a cup of coffee, talking to him. I've got to make this decision and I've got, I can do this or this and a coworker being a friend, a brother in Christ can say, um, well, you know, follow what God gives you and pray mm -hmm. about it. But certainly we can't make, and we shouldn't want to make decisions for people that are coworkers, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's say a coworker decides I may leave the company and go to take this job or, I might put in for this job, you know, whatever. And with wisdom, we wouldn't say, well, you should do this. Because if it if he does that and it goes the wrong way or he thinks it is, right. then we've, we've given him the wrong information. Right. But if we tell him to pray about it, make the decision based on mm -hmm. what God gives him, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. And so many times God gives us confirmation after we seek him he will give us an answer right we may have to continue praying about it absolutely well you know a lot of what we talked about today and i was talking about mothers who working their way out of a job no longer the mommy kids grow up this could and you brought it up at the beginning of it this can be referring to anything that it's a chapter closing yeah. a d job decision retirement moving to a new place yeah. You can stay held back with those binding ties to what was before. Mm -hmm. Or you can release that. Because, you know, as parent, we say, well, they're not our children. We're just lent them by the Lord. Well, do you believe that or not? Mm -hmm. Is my life God's decision or is it mine? 
You know, if your boss at work tells you to do something and when you do it, everything just falls apart, are they going to fire you? <laughs> no. No, they're going to go to your boss and say, um, this happened. Why did you tell your employee to do that? Mm -hmm. And and if we believe that our children are lent to us by the Lord, we're to do what we do. But at a certain point, the Lord takes them back and says, okay, I'm in charge now. You've mm -hmm. done your job. For good or bad, you've done your job. You let me handle it from here on out. And I'll tell you, the Lord can fix everything that we messed up. He is the magic eraser. Mm -hmm. But it's between him and them, not us. Mm -hmm. We release it. Hey, Rowan. Hopefully, we're finishing up, but hopefully you can hit the replay. <laughs> Y'all have a blessed day. Now, Thursday night Bible study, are you going to have it? No, nah, because I don't know if you'll need to be preparing for the festival. Uh, we've got a big art to craft show. I, we'll just have to see. Well, I'm having we'll to work each know. evening. We because have, the heat. yeah, we have a big yellow meated watermelon festival coming up, and we're part of that. I know, um, and that'll be this weekend in Ashland, and um, we have a lot going on with that. And then um, next week, everything should be back in order, shouldn't it? No, what's happening next week? Yeah, it's always something next week. It's always. <laughs> What are you talking well, about? Well, I know you won't be with me because you no. have a meeting at work, but no, I should be here next I have a pre-planned meeting next Tuesday. Uh, but I'll be session. here, and we'll just see how that Thursday goes. Well, the meeting is in the morning, and I'm kind of <gasps> hoping they will let me finish and Come head on. out. So I'm doing a little training session for some people. Maybe they'll put me up front. I appreciate time. him joining us because y'all don't realize sometimes – It'll be like five minutes to one, and he's in his office working on something. And I say, can you stop? Can you stop to do Bible study? And he gives up his lunch hour usually to do that. So I appreciate you. I'm close. It's just right around this wall. <laughs> yep. God bless. We will see y'all Sunday if you join us for home church. Bye.